Hello, welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, and welcome to as regal and aristocratic an episode as we've had. Now, if I look back at my career in television, I've spent time with some pretty cool and influential people, whether it's Evander Holyfield in the world of boxing, Brian Lara in the world of cricket, Tico Torres from Bon Jovi in the world of music. But when it comes to somebody who absolutely sits at the top of and controls an industry with an iron fist, then this is probably as good as it gets. He's an icon in South African wine, somebody I've been fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time with over the years, basically talking about cricket rather than wine though, to be honest. And today I find myself in his very private cellar. Only eight other members of the public have ever been allowed in here before, so I'm very excited. Michael Fridjohn, welcome to the show. A lot of fun to be here, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, the, the Michael Fridjohn story is what I'm, I'm really fascinated uh, about learning today. You've brought out some fabulous wine, which you're going to talk about shortly, and it probably uh, rules out me doing anything meaningful for the rest of today, which I'm very happy with. Um, but before we get into some of the wine and have a taste of it, because it does look fabulous, uh, I'm fascinated to hear that very first part of Michael Fridjohn's story, because we mention your name now in the wine industry, and people generally quiver or reach for their selfie stick or an autograph book. Uh, you've got... Uh, so much time now almost defining the industry here in South Africa and beyond. But how did it all start? How did you first stumble into wine and decide this might be something that you could make for a living out of? Stumble is the operative word. It was a misspeed And um, my parents were of that generation where they served kids wine, initially with a big splash of water, and then as we got older with less and less water. And we were expected to learn to manage it and to behave well. And I had to say... I went to a school where, it was King Edward's, the annual matric debating a dramatic society dinner at the Sunnyside Park, wine was served to everybody there. Would never happen today. So by the time I went to university, I really liked wine. And my parents' friends, we were really fortunate for people living what was called the Transvaal, um, certainly in the 1960s and early 70s. There wasn't a lot of wine being sold here. It was a a kind of culture where a lot of restaurants didn't have wine lists at all. They didn't have wine licenses. People would arrive with their bottle of whiskey and the restaurant would automatically bring them a couple of tumblers and a little bucket of ice and some soda water or else they would, um, I suppose, supply them legally or illegally with beer. But wine wasn't part of the culture. But my parents and my parents' friends were very much into wine. So I learned about it. I grew up with it. And by the time I got to university and couldn't make up my mind what I really would be doing for a career, I discovered that firstly I could work in the trade. Secondly, I then managed a year in France, straight after my honours year. And I suppose I polished up the little knowledge I had with a little bit more. And I came back to Johannesburg, um, fairly knowledgeable about international wines and not unschooled in South African wines. And Benny Goldberg's, which in those days was the, really was the largest liquor store in the world, gave me a job straight up as imports director with a car and a salary that was significantly more than any of my friends were earning. <laughs> so I thought I made for life. I did get a bit bored quite quickly. And so I branched out into other areas of the industry of which the Reciprocal Wine Trading Company was one. It's been a fairly lengthy and meandering journey in that you've touched on so many different spaces in the wine world and I think that's probably what's kept you interested and excited for so long but in terms of that first excitement do you remember a particular bottle of wine or a particular moment around wine that something clicked and you thought right this is really really going to be for me well yes and it has to be as it probably is for many people Pinot Noir and Burgundy so it came in two parts my parents friends included a man who imported from a vineyard in Burgundy called Claude Lombre. And in those distant days, a magnum of 1949 Claude Lombre cost all of 10 rand 80, I think, <laughs> which wasn't nothing. A bottle of Niederberg Cabernet probably cost two rand. So relatively speaking, you could buy a really smart bottle with real maturity for at least a reasonable multiple of the price of a bottle of local red. And... Um, Vittorino Managelli of the gallery fan arrived one evening for dinner with a magnum for the family just because that's what he did. And quite soon on, he said, you know, I often add water to my wine and did exactly that, which astonished me. But um, we also had copious quantities of 1949 Claude Lombre, which did set me 
partly or directly on that course. I did two stages at Claire de Lombre, and so I learned directly at the estate and spent time in the cellar there. And the other episode was that my father had a brief and, as it turned out, not very successful career as a stockbroker. And when he ceased to be a stockbroker, what remained, amongst other things, was a bottle of Richburg from the Domaine de la Romani Conti. And for his, I think, 60th birthday, we opened the last remnants of the time that he thought he had money. And it was <laughs> everything that you would expect from a great Burgundy. And I remember at the end of the evening, with my nose in the empty bottle, just because the spicy, heady scents of that wine was so haunting, I couldn't give up the dregs that were there. So, yes, after that, what else was I going to do for a living? <laughs> you, uh, you certainly didn't start on a low note in terms of embracing wine, did you? No, nor in terms of a career. I mean, working at Benny Goldberg's full-time for three years in the late 70s with pretty much unlimited budgets to shop internationally and locally. Um, I was given also the brief of creating the first house brand range of wines, I think, of any retailer in South Africa and the complete freedom to do what I wanted to do just as long as I could justify it. And the business was driven by marketing rather than bottom line. It had such huge momentum that the bottom line, in a sense, took care of itself. But no one ever said, can you prove that these 18 items on the SKU list are making money? Because they never needed to. The business was making so much money selling beer and brandy and whiskey that that wine department was just an extra bit of cream on top, and I had the freedom to do what I liked with it. It really was um, life-changing uh, in every sense. So I started in retail and worked my way back into the wholesale side, into the blending side, into the branding side, into the marketing side. And by the time I decided to become an industry consultant, which was about 1983 or four years in, and actually completely presumptuous on my part. Um, I really did have a broad and quite deep knowledge in a way that most people who had followed a career path, joined one company, never moved out of that particular um, position. I had it. I could do it. So I did lots of consulting, worked with a lot of international firms, and along the way bought a minority share in an import business, and that was in 1980. So 40 years later, I'm still here. Well, let's dive into that import business, because I don't think either of us can resist uh, this wine any longer, and, and start with the first of them. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a French wine. It's a rather nice uh, start. I think this will be the best breakfast I'll have this year by some distance. Uh, introduce us to the, to the first of these wines and uh, how it forms part of your current empire. So when I bought into Reciprocal, um, the company had been owned and run by a few professionals, an accountant, a lawyer, a forensic pathologist. And I think they had started the business thinking it would be a tax-efficient way of filling their cellars. turned out, of course, as many people know, a really expensive way to do it. So they <laughs> exited the business, and we cleared up all the agencies and all the stock they had. And in early 1980, I negotiated to become the importer for Louis Latour, which is a great Burgundy house and one of the great landowners in Burgundy. And they are the, in fact, I think they own more Grand Cru and Premier Cru vineyard than anyone else in Burgundy. And their primary holdings are on the hill of Corton, which is northernmost Cote de Bone and the only place in the Cote de Bone where you have Grand Cru white wine and Grand Cru red wine. So you can have Corton red, Le Corton, and you can have Charlemagne and Corton Charlemagne white. And this is a Corton Charlemagne from Louis Latour. When I arrived in February 1980 to sign off the accords with old man Latour, I was treated to lunch in the kind of boardroom of Latour. And the white wine that he served, so this is 1980, was a 1959 Corton Charlemagne. And the red wine that he served was the Chateau Corton Grancy. 1923. It was a pretty good start to a relationship that's carried on very well for 40 odd years. And it's, it, it's not just a beautiful relationship, but I think it's quite an important one in the South African context in that as much as we are promoting and driving the sale of South African wine and trying to help an industry that's been under the cosh so much, 
uh, being able to compare what we're making with the great wines as this is, is a, it's a really important benchmark for the South African industry, but also allows those of us who love our wine to kind of see what the differences are and, and see how they compare and, and see how we're doing as a South African wine industry. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen reciprocal as a competitor to the industry. I've always seen it as an adjunct. South Africa buys very little imported wine. We are really patriotic and brand loyal. But where we do bring in imported wine, generally, it has to be something that supplements what is available locally. And I've always used reciprocal with that as a perspective. So those early agencies, which were uh, Louis Latour, Chateau de Beau Castel, uh, Baron de la Dusset, and then a bit later in the day, um, specialist firms in Bordeaux, like uh, Domaine's Baron de Rothschild and Schroeder and Schaller. Every one of those was chosen with a kind of sense of, would it add to what is available? The other thing which has been pretty much a rule at Reciprocal is we work with family-owned businesses. And there's a real logic to that. Family-owned businesses are not trying to humor shareholders are not driven by quarterly profit statements. And so if you look at Louis Latour, still family owned, Schroeder and Schaller, family owned, Gigal, whose Rhone business is extraordinary, 100% family owned, Ruder, the largest um, family owned champagne house, still 100%. That family connection is real, and none of those arrangements, absolutely none of them, has a written contract. Every one of those relationships is a handshake, and it's based on interpersonal relations. It's very important. Now, there might be a suggestion, people are thinking, oh, that must be because Michael is such a decent man, he's such a proven businessman, he loves his wine. Of course, none of that is true at all in terms of the real reason. The real reason is they look at you with great admiration because you are a cricket international, and in France, it doesn't get bigger as a sportsman than that. Well... You know, you say that with just a hint of frivolousness, but I have to remind you that the first scheduled test match was going to be between England and France, and it was cancelled on account of the French Revolution. So <laughs> able to join the Further Foresters team uh, to play cricket in Burgundy in the mid-1990s was not just a privilege, but it was a historic moment. It was pretty nearly a fatal one as well, <laughs> I have to tell you. I hadn't played cricket for many years, and it was a matting wicket on a field um, just outside Burgundy, which was normally used for football and had never been rolled underneath the matting. And <laughs> it was a clay pitch that had obviously dried out with lots of footprints and stud marks in it. So the mat did not lie flat. And the wiki, in fact, was taken off to hospital to have his face stitched as a spin bowler in his 60s managed to get the ball to turn and lift such extraordinary speed that it took out his eyebrow completely. So my cricket career, uh, international cricket career, was short, sharp, but at least not fatal. <laughs> <laughs> that might actually pop you up. Uh, you know when Top Gear, they've got the, the Times, all the celebrities. I think you go to the top of the Dan Really Likes Wine Sporting Celebrity list, which was previously topped by Gerard Holden from Holden Mance, who has won rugby international for Uganda against Tanzania. <laughs> But I think cricket against France might just be one better. Well, as I say, I reckon they both rival each other in risk of death. <laughs> oh dear. Um, you, you've clearly over the years developed not just a love of, of French wine, but the, the French people, these relationships you have, uh, the French culture, in as much as it's possible to sum up. What is that sense of magic for you? Why has France, its wine, its culture got under your skin the way it has? You know, um, Somebody once said that language is a sexually transmitted disease. And so the year I spent in France, I discovered, almost coincidentally, that I'd learned to speak French. It sort of just happened. And once I had enough of French language to be able to engage, however crudely, however unpolished, in French, the French are just extraordinarily warm. There is an antipathy to the English which we all know about. Um, I met a girl who said that her mother, who was French, arrived in France with an English registered car and was treated like absolute rubbish until they discovered she was French and then the community warmed instantly. So there is that. And once you get to the French, they are fun-loving, they are very precise. There is a, a real snobbery 
in a way, but it's a snobbery that comes with a real belief in their own culture, in their own history. And in the wine industry, there's a very fine line between tradition for tradition's sake and tradition because you really believe that in every generation it is your duty to improve upon what the previous generation did no matter how high the bar was set. And that's the part that really excites me, that there is this constant quest to make it better, to embrace modern technology, but not to give up the tradition, the culture, the food and wine, uh, and it's very proper. You know, you go to some pretty exciting dinners and banquets in France, but I have to say, I have never seen people stumbling out. And it may be that the wines were poured slightly more parsimoniously than we would in South Africa. Maybe <laughs> the people are just better at doing it. And um, it really is a, a culture that you can embrace, providing they embrace you back which uh, means always uh, I find adopting a slightly more South African accent when one arrives in France. Just to make it absolutely clear, you're not over from London. Well, let me tell you a real story. I remember going to Marseille when I was a student, so it would have been 1975, say, and meeting an old man who, when he discovered we were from South Africa, said to me that he had seen Paul Kruger arrive in France. And he... It was perfectly possible if he had been 80. And he said he had remembered sitting on his grandfather's shoulders as Kruger arrived and made his way up the main drag of Marseille as a fundraiser. So the French were very generously doing They were throwing money and people were collecting it. And he said the British and the hotels had closed the shutters in protest. But he said he did see some money slipping through the shutters and being sent down. So there is an affinity between South Africa and France, which goes back to, obviously, the animosity between France and England and the Boer War. And I find it's amplified every time I'm in France and conversation starts about rugby. Uh, Cheslin Colby, the latest uh, version of that story, but they've been great ones over the while. And my, my fa favourite experiences in France have often been around uh, meeting somebody, drinking wine and talking rugby in France. You've had so many experiences. You mentioned signing up with the Latour family and the incredible vintages you drank there. Is there a, another memory of time in France uh, that really stands out as being one you'll never forget? I, I worked a stint at Lafitte, or for Domaine Baron de Rothschild, on a project in the early 1990s. And the MD of Domaine Baron de Rothschild was a guy called Christophe Salin. And firstly, it astonished me that he had bits of Afrikaans, quite good bits of Afrikaans. He played rugby in Bordeaux, but he had in fact worked for a company that was a sped button yard that I think built a tunnel somewhere in the Western Cape before he had his career in wine. So he'd in fact lived for two years in South Africa. He swore fluently in Afrikaans and he <laughs> had played rugby for two years while he was working for sped button yard. So yeah, that connection, you see it all the time. <laughs> Well, it's a connection that now feeds into the wine that Reciprocal brings into South Africa and brings in most happily. Uh, and this is a, just a glorious way to start the day. And it's amplified by another part of this Free John Empire, the glassware that we're drinking. And uh, this is not just a, a random selection. It's, it's picked quite carefully. And uh, I know it's an area that uh, it almost veers into science in terms of how a glass, particularly with a great wine, really does amplify your experience. So... These are Riedel glasses, and like most people, I started off completely cynical about the idea that you could tailor the shape of a glass in such a way that it would make Chardonnay, this is a wooded Chardonnay glass, taste a whole lot better than if it were in another glass with an equally large bowl. And, so, and, and, and that experience is by no means unique. Mondavi challenged Riedel in public once and then tasted it and said he's never made such a fool of himself. So it really <laughs> does make a difference. We can pull up a glass, you can empty this into any other glass you have in front of you. You will not get the richness, the warmth, you won't get the integration of the oak. So the Riedel glass and the fact that it is absolutely and scientifically tested, so they work with a whole lot of different shapes and they narrow them down till they have one that works best for that particular variety. I have been on the tasting panels which make those selections 
and you start off with 10 glasses, which have lots of different shapes, and you work on a panel, and you start off simply by eliminating those that obviously don't work. What is interesting is that even in that very early stage, there's unanimity between the tasters as to which glasses don't work. And then finally you get down to the one or two, and there might be some debate, and they tweak around that design until they really get a glass that in this case best expresses um, Corton Charlemagne, which is a wooded Chardonnay, and how it would perform. And this is a Cab Merlot glass, which is completely different. I see you have there a Shiraz glass. It mm -hmm. looks almost the same, but in fact you put Shiraz into that glass and it tastes much more peppery. You put Bordeaux into that glass, it tastes more tanny. And the differences appear marginal, but when you taste, it's there, it's absolutely discernible. One of the fun things to do is to take a wine, I've done this in fact at tastings, pour the same wine into four different glasses, but before people come into the room, and then ask them firstly to score the wines and then try and guess what the variety is. And when it's the variety in the glass designated for that variety, most people get it. It certainly is the one that gets the highest score. Often people have no idea that they've been tasting the same wine. <laughs> a kind of funny experiment that the wine lovers revel in. Anyway, when it first started, these were sort of QAnon-like theories, glass rubbish can't possibly be right. Uh, it's now changed a lot, people are appreciating and understanding it. Uh, just with this particular Chardonnay glass, in the most laymanish of layman terms, why does this work for Chardonnay? Okay, so, and in fact, the glass has not so much a wider bowl as a shallower depth. That against that. And one of the important things that Riedel, Max Riedel's grandfather discovered when this process was first really scientifically um, established in the 1950s is it's not just the bowl and the way it delivers aroma. It's the shape of the lip and how it delivers wine onto your palate. So although we now know that the areas of the tongue that pick up sweet, sour, salt and bitter, that's all your tongue can taste, are not partitioned off the way we were first led to believe. There are parts of the tongue that are more sensitive to bitterness, more sensitive to sweetness, to saltiness. If you direct the stream of a very tannic wine onto that part of your tongue most sensitive to bitterness, your brain impression of that wine will be a lot more negative. In the case of a wine like this, it's a wider lip which gives it a wider pour into your mouth. It coats your tongue, and it also goes down from the side of your tongue into your throat. But in doing so, it coats the side, which is also acid sensitive. Mm -hmm. But it gets there after it's been warmed by your tongue. Your tongue is like a baseball catcher's mitt. And you don't think about this, but if your tongue didn't do a great catching job, you'd choke. So as you pour fluid into your mouth, it has to land on your tongue. Does your tongue narrow and catch like this? Does your tongue do that? And the lip of the glass determines exactly how that wine is received. So you get a taste impression that correlates to the aromatic impression. And in that way, the wine comes to you as a coherent aesthetic whole. So what I want you to do now is press pause go and find a range of different glasses. They might not be the exact ones, because you're buying those uh, from Michael later today online from Riedel. Uh, but try them. Just run through what Michael just said. It's fascinating. And I think it's going to just open up your eyes a little to, to the wine that we're drinking. Uh, and this, uh, this Chardonnay is obviously benefiting magnificently from the glass. Uh, taking that same approach, why is then this working? And what are we drinking? To find out what wine we're drinking, join us next week on Dan Really Likes Wine for part two of our very special interview with Michael Fridjohn.